and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast. And today we have a special episode with Christian Raffensperger, a name that you should all be familiar with because he's been mentioned many times. Christian, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. So Rus is often skipped over in just a couple of chapters in histories, but uh, you've been spending a couple of decades already studying it. How did you get interested in Rus and what captured your imagination about it? Yeah, that's one of those funny things. Um, you know, I've gotten so many people asking me, are you are you Russian? Are you Ukrainian? <laughs> and, and I'm not. Uh, you know, it was one of those situations where uh, when I was in high school was when the Glasnost and Perestroika, and I found that so fascinating and, and to watch the world change. Um, and I'd always had, ever since I was little, a fascination with the medieval world and, you know, played with, you know, knights and castles and things like that. Uh, and it wasn't until I was in college that I took a class on the Vikings and, and found out about Vikings in Eastern Europe. And it just, I mean, my imagination went from there. And so, you know, I didn't immediately proceed to graduate school, but once I did make that choice, that's what I wanted to study and to learn more about. And, you know, JP, as you were saying, you know, it's so often left out of our story, both our story for Eastern Europe and for Slavis, but also the story of medieval Europe. And as I was reading in graduate school, I kept seeing all of these connections and wondering, why don't people talk more about these connections? And so, you know, that's really been the focus of what I've done uh, in my scholarship. Yeah, I think uh, I started off around the same time with Perestroika and the end of the Soviet Union. So yeah, similar things got us interested there. Yeah. How did we end up, especially I think in the Anglophone world, with this picture of, middle, of the Middle Ages that is missing the entire eastern part of Europe, basically? Yeah, so I've actually been writing a lot of historiography in the past few years and, and trying to investigate that very question. And, you know, the more I read back into the 18th and 19th century of these historians, um, you know, there is a kind of civilizational impulse that equates modern nations with medieval states. And so England maps really nicely. France maps really nicely. Uh, the Germans, of course, had to come up with their own special special way, their own Zonderweg. Um, and then it begins to break down a little bit the farther east you go. And one of my favorite examples is the Cambridge History of Medieval Europe uh, that Bury edited at the beginning of the 20th century. And he puts Byzantium and Eastern Europe in one volume. And he says, yeah, you know, I did that on purpose because really they don't ever interact with the rest of medieval Europe. Oh, I mean, except for the Crusades. And then that's just a us acting on them. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, I mean, I think we can trace it at least to him, but certainly we could go back, you know, even to D Gibbon and the decline and fall, uh, we see some of those roots of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, obviously, when I was at university, our studies of Russian history were much more focused on the modern period, and we just skipped through Rus in a couple of lectures. And yeah, so working on this podcast, I've been surprised how many connections there are yeah the, the rest of the world yes that's right and uh, of course other places like bulgaria and hungary that were significant places also missing from the history that we're taught in schools absolutely well and for medieval history those places are really um trying to make a name for themselves well I mean, not just for medieval but for for all kinds of history they're making a name for themselves as being part of europe and so we're seeing a rebirth of labels like Central and East Central Europe and uh, New Europe and things like that. Um, and, you know, what still often gets left out is is Rus um, and is that farther East portion, because the label Eastern Europe is still a, a negative one, especially from uh, people or with people who suffered through the domination of the Soviet experience. Yeah. Um... So sometimes people will say that uh, the reason we're cutting off you know, these parts of Eastern Europe and Byzantium is the Orthodox Christianity and the world was divided. But what I've learned from your work is uh, how many interactions there were still going on with the uh, church in the German territories, with Rome and the Pope himself. So... Yaroslav, who we 
just covered in the last episode, died in the same year as the Great Schism. But when did that divide actually become something that split Eastern Europe and the rest of you know, the Catholic world? So. Yeah, so that's not something in the 11th century that matters to much of anyone other than some ecclesiastics. And the, the Schism of 1054 um, is actually rescinded. Uh, you know, I mean, they're they're forgiven on both sides, and so things go on apace. It's really not until the 13th century that people begin to really care. Um, you know, in 1222, we get the first crusade declared against Rus, and that's going to be, you know, that's really the big thing. There's a legate named William of Sabina who's active in the Baltic and the Livonian territories, and uh, he's going to be very instrumental in uh, kind of gathering up and directing the focus of let's fight against Rus. All of that, of course, grows out of the Fourth Crusade in 1204. Um, so that's when the Rusians, I, I really do think, begin to look at themselves and think like, oh, maybe we are different. Um, and that's mm -hmm. that's something that hadn't occurred to most of the people we're talking about beforehand, certainly, you know, the Greek ecclesiastics who were running the church in Kiev, you know, I mean, they knew that they were, you know, part of a, a you know, they were subordinate to the patriarch of Constantinople. But for the, the ruling family and for the people we have sources on, it doesn't seem to have really occurred to them in that way. I mean, for instance, when, when the first Germans arrive in Livonia, uh, they think of themselves as crusaders. They're fighting against local pagans. They often will get help from the the local Rusians. So it takes a little while for that to gestate into a uh, religious difference. Just a note for people, because we haven't got to that part of the story yet, but Livonia is on the Baltic coast, up where the uh, Baltic states are today. Yeah, modern day Estonia and Latvia. Yeah, that's interesting because, as well, with what's happening today, where we have the Russian Orthodox Church claiming that the choice of orthodoxy was Rus establishing a separate civilization, while the Ukrainian Orthodox Church is saying that no, the choice of orthodoxy was joining Europe. Yeah, you're right. I mean, that's you know deeply invested in what's happening. Well, and we see. Uh, I'm teaching a class on, on Rus right now uh, at my university, and we're just to the part where uh, the, the Metropolitans, Peter and Fiognosos, um, you know, are making the choice to uh, back Moscow um, against Tver in particular uh, in the, the early 14th century. And so this is this really interesting moment where we begin to see a political and a religious identification that will culminate, and here I'm going to do something that, that I will often criticize others for doing, but jump forward hundreds of years to the 1897 census, where to be Orthodox is to be Russian, right? And so we're eventually going to get those things put together, and we're, we see that just starting uh, in the 14th century. It's, it's nascent. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, from English history anyway, as we study it in Britain, obviously, the question of marriages between Protestants and Catholics comes up with our royal families and everything. And so we see in Vladimir and Yaroslav, they start marrying their children into royal families across Europe. Was there any issue between marrying Catholics and Orthodox back in those days? No, nor was there any such terminology. I mean, everybody was, they were Christian or they were pagan. Um, if there were marriages with Jews or Muslims, right, that would have been a big deal. Um, but the few marriages we do know, for instance, with pagans from the, the, the nomadic world, um, we only know about them because those women, and they're exclusively women, uh, convert to Christianity. Well, almost exclusively, there's one example that jumps to mind. Uh, they convert to Christianity, um, and then you know, we'll take a, a Christian name, etc. So let's uh, talk about the marriages more, because I know it's been a big area of your uh, work um yeah sometimes looking back people can think that in the middle ages women were kind of you know chattel with no rights that were just handed around to seal deals between male kings uh what were these marriages really like between uh, you know, the daughters of yaroslav say and the, the king of france and harold hard yeah, and so people 
Right. So you're right. I mean, you know, uh, George Vernadsky's famous Kiev and Russia book, um, you know, dismisses the sum total of the dynastic marriages in about a sentence and a half. And and partly it's because they're women and partly it's because they leave the area of his interest. Uh, but if we look at these women as, you know, queenship studies and, and all of this great uh, literature um, has shown over the last 30 and 40 years, um, what we see is that these women are cared for by their families, they're nurtured, uh, they're trained, uh, and they're trained to be advocates for their natal family. And so when they go away, when they go into a marriage, so Anna Yaroslavna marrying Henry in France in the middle of the 11th century, she doesn't go alone, right? She's going to have an entourage. She's going to have guards. She's going to have a confessor. She's going to have uh, ladies in waiting. She's going to have stuff, right? And we get that uh, in a little bit later in the 11th century with Yevpraxia, who goes to the German Empire, right? We've got this note that she carries with her all this stuff. And, and because of the way medieval chronicles are written, it's her. But realistically speaking, this 14-year-old is not taking this large baggage train all the way from Rus to Germany by herself, right? There's going to be other people involved. The chroniclers just don't care to mention them because they're not important people in the chronicler's mind. So what we're really seeing is we're seeing an island of Rusian language, culture, etc., cetera, um, in the heart of a foreign kingdom. And not just an island, but really it's an embassy. And that ambassador is um, at the heart of government, right? And if we're talking about government as personal politics in the Middle Ages, which often happens, and I think is accurate, you know, that ambassador has her residence in the bedchamber of the king of this other land, right? And so that's going to make for a lot of power, potential power anyway, uh, in some of those relationships. Uh, and for instance, in the, in the one with Anna, you know, one of the most well-known things about her is that she helps dictate the names of the kids. The Capetians had a pretty uh, rigid naming policy, and she introduces Philip into it, which, of course, uh, you know, for our purposes, is a very French name, um, but uh, is not introduced into the French royal line until until uh, her firstborn son. Where, where does that name come from for the Rus? Well, so it probably comes from Saint Philip, um, you know, which comes from. Uh, you know, uh, the early Christian saints, um, you know, there was potentially a Philip, uh, the uh, second, a second century Christian emperor of the Roman Empire who was a crypto Christian. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is a saint that we see in Menologion in uh, Rus uh, that was not particularly popular in the West, but it seems likely that this is where that name came from. Just a side digression, I was wondering. Um... When did uh, the Rus start to move to using their Christian names, so to speak, rather than you know, whatever names they were given at birth, you know, baptismal names? Because you know, got names like yeah, Philippe and Ivan being like variation of John. But, um, in the 11th century, they're still being called you know, Sviatoslav and Yaroslav and other things, but even though Yaroslav is Georgi, is George, right. is his baptismal name, doesn't really use that name. No, he doesn't. You're right. And we see in the 11th and 12th centuries, we see um, several people, you know, most famously uh, Volodymyr Monomach, who uses a nickname. Uh, his son, you know, Mstislav Harold, uh, is called Harold in the Scandinavian sources. Um, and so we do see nicknames prevalent too. And uh, we don't see that shift to a naming policy uh, that you're talking about until the, the 13th century. And, and we still actually, in that time, will sometimes see a persistence of some of those older names. But increasingly, our chroniclers are just recording a Christian name, which presents us with the suggestion that they are only getting that Christian name. So they're just Ivan. They're not um, Yaroslav. Christened Ivan. Mm -hmm. So do you like to tell people a bit more maybe about Yvpraxia, because she's one of the interesting cases? Yeah. Yeah, boy, I love Yvpraxia. Uh, I've written about her several times in a variety of different contexts. So, um, you know, the second half of the 11th century in medieval Europe is most uh, known for the investiture controversy. Um, 
which is typically talked about between the German Empire and the papacy, where there is a discussion during the Gregorian reform of the papacy over who gets to appoint bishops and priests. Uh, Pope Gregory VII, quite famously, even though he's following on the path of Leo, um, says only he can do that, only the church can do that, and the German emperor Henry IV says, no, I can do that as well, um, and there's conflict between the two of them, and they go looking for support. Actually, Henry IV has a lot of support, um, and he wants to buttress that, and he ends up creating his own, uh, we call him an anti-pope, Clement III, and there's a whole bunch of history there with uh, Henry's dad creating a, 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 the first German pope, which was Clement II. Um, so, you know, there's uh, I talk about Henry IV having a lot of daddy issues here, wanting to emulate Henry III. Um, and so one of the things that the anti-pope Clement III does is he reaches out to Rus. And um, we have a parallel interaction because Henry himself reaches out and tries to arrange a marriage. He himself is married to a woman named Bertha, so he arranges a marriage between one of his noblemen, um, actually of an appropriate age, which is very nice and considerate, um, with uh, the Siebla's daughter, Yevpraxia. Um, and at the same time that's going on, we see uh, Clement III reach out to the Metropolitan in Kiev, uh, who is Ioan II, and say, you know, what do you think about recognizing me instead of the patriarch, etc.? And the, the disconnect between the two responses is, I think, key to something we were talking about earlier in regard to the schism. Um, so one part of it would be the political side. Great, let's have this marriage. The Russians, since Yaroslav, have been looking for a marriage with the Germans. Let's do it. And the religious side, Iwan II, writes back and says, no, are you crazy? You guys, no, we're not going to do anything with you. And, you know, frankly, if you want to... Uh, maintain any further correspondence directed to Constantinople. I don't even want to talk to you. Um, so there is this divide between what the Metropolitan in Kiev is doing and what the political leaders in Kiev are doing. And, and they're not located very far apart, uh, but they're oriented in the world in very different ways. And, you know, uh, Jonathan Shepard and others have, have done more work on the Metropolitans than I have um, and, you know, noted about how little they integrate themselves often into Russian society in the 11th and 12th centuries. You know, they're Greek, they may not speak uh, Slavic, um, you know, they may have to have translations done for them, all of those sorts of things. Yeah. Oh, and then, so, pardon me. All right, so Yevpraxia ends up married into the German Empire, um, but then not only does she marry into the German Empire, but she will, after the death of her first husband, remarry to Emperor Henry IV himself, and so she becomes Empress of the German Empire, which is the highest place Rusi and the most visible Rusian woman in, in all of medieval Europe. Um, and that works out fine for a little while, but eventually she leaves him and sides with the papacy against him in the investiture controversy. And she will go on to speak uh, at a variety of synods with bishops. Uh, and most famously in 1095 at the Papal Synod of Urban II in Piacenza. Um, and and you know, it's very interesting. You were talking or asking earlier about women's place in medieval history. Um, all of the people who write about the investiture controversy tend to discount Yevpraxia and her participation. You know, even excellent scholarship. Um, she's just not considered that important. And then when they get to her speaking at these these synods, it's like, well, I mean, she probably didn't really speak, but all of our sources say that she spoke, right? They say that she, you know, delivered this, she talked, right? So they use these words that indicate um, that she did these things, and yet we are reading into the past to say, you know, I don't think women could do that, um, and so that's problematic. And so actually, Yevpraxia is a player in this regard, and she is participating in this for potentially, you know, much larger um, political issues that are going on in medieval Europe. And, you know, the real thing that I think, you know, puts a bow on this whole situation is that after this, she ends up back in Rus, and in the early 12th century, she joins a monastery uh, and becomes a nun. Um, and the date for this is in the Povest Vemuniculiet, uh, and it indicates that it's the same year that Henry IV died which is interesting because 
uh, you know, part of becoming a nun is is becoming a bride of Christ. And so she waited till her husband died, even though she was estranged mm-hmm. from him for so long, before becoming a nun. And a few years later, she dies, and uh, she gets a burial in the Kievan Caves Monastery, the holiest monastery in all of Rus. She gets the erection of her own chapel there. Uh, and so she married into the German Empire. She sided with the papacy against the German Empire, and yet she also gets burial in the holiest monastery in Rus. So, I mean, there's certainly no mm-hmm. ecclesiastical divide there that we can see in the late 11th, early 12th century. Right, yes. And these marriages generally, there were quite a few of them. Um, was it just, you know, a royal bride needs a royal husband, or was the ruler of Rus at any particular time pursuing some kind of strategic aims in right, building alliances for some purpose? Yeah. Certainly, we see a lot of pursuing alliances, um, you know, less so with the marriage with Anna to uh, Henry of France, but but we see that with marriages with the Poles and the Hungarians in particular, um, where we see efforts made to try and connect often particular families within the larger clan, the ruling clan of Rus, uh, to groups in those kingdoms so that they can work together to do certain things. And so... I mean, to take another Yaroslav example, Yaroslav arranges for uh, two connections between his family and the Mishkovici of Poland uh, in the middle of the 11th century as a way to try and help um, Casimir restore the kingdom of Poland and conquer Mazovia, which had been a breakaway region. Uh, he arranges two marriages and then commits troops, and he even will uh, capture Mitslav, uh, who is the leader of Mazovia, and turns him over to Casimir rather than keeping him so we see that he is trying to pacify that that border with the poles and build a secure border there so that he can focus on something else. We also see kind of a more generalized strategy in the 11th century in which Rus becomes home to exiled rulers. And those rulers are taken in, they're taken care of, they're married off to local people, uh, and then they're sent home. Um, you know, sometimes they aren't married off to local people. So, for instance, Olaf, the king of Norway, who will become Saint Olaf, he comes to Rus and he's welcomed by Yaroslav and Ingegerd. Ingegerd, in fact, and he had been betrothed briefly before Yaroslav wooed her away. Um, and he comes just for sanctuary because of his fight against King Canute. Uh, and he brings his son Magnus with him later, and Magnus is fostered at the court of Yaroslav and Ingegerd before he eventually goes back to take the throne. So we see a lot of interactions that are pragmatic, I would argue, that they are attempting, Yaroslav and Ingegerd, for example, are attempting to build good relations by kind of gambling on the future, by taking in these uh, outlaws, right, and hoping they will become in-laws, kind of in the famous Robin Hood example. So we had uh, Anna in France, uh, we had uh, the Agafia presumably married to the English pretender who never managed to take the throne. Edward the Exile um, but, died before he arrived. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But uh, So did, the, did these medieval marriages have any long-term influence on Rus, Rus and then maybe later relations with uh, Western Europe? Obviously, with Poland, there was quite a lot going on for the coming centuries. Yeah, well, I'm not sure. I mean, if you want to cut, count Hungary, I mean, there's a lot of 12th century action with Hungary where we see numerous intermarriages that allow for Hungarian intervention in Russian affairs. Um, and then certainly there's a, a very famous individual, Boris Kalamanovich. Boris is the, the son of um, Kalaman, the king of Hungary, and a Russian princess. Um, some Hungarian sources say that, in fact, he's not Kalaman's son, he's a bastard. Uh, but but Polish and Bohemian sources both say he's no, he's really Kalaman's son. Um, and he tries to claim the throne for about 30 years in the middle of the 12th century while uh, he's, you know, arguing with uh, his step uh, or his cousins, 
uh, who are controlling the throne among the Arpods. Um, but then he's making alliances with the Poles. He's making alliances with Byzantium. He's making alliances with the Bohemians. Uh, so we see a lot of continuing ramifications of some of those marriages, less so the farther abroad they go. Right. Okay, so um, I think maybe the uh, first time I mentioned you on the podcast was this back at the beginning of Rus discussing why I was going to call Kniaz's Kings. Uh-huh. Um, I don't know, you, you wrote a short book about yep. uh, back you know, when I was first studying uh, university as well. I, I didn't really understand why we were calling these guys princes when they didn't seem to have any emperor or anybody over the top of them. Right. Um, so I, I just mentioned it fairly briefly back then, but you know, maybe you could uh, write a bit more detail about why why we should call the rulers of Rus kings and you know, maybe compare them to what else was going on with other people that we call kings. If people object that maybe things weren't so centralized in Rus and you had these competing brothers and whatever at various times. Right, yeah, so this is a, an interesting one because, you know, I talked about this for a long time, about how King uh, Kenyatta should be translated as king. Um, and, you know, the crux of the issue is that I really think we need to follow our primary sources, like I was talking about with Yefraxia at these papal synods. Our primary sources from the medieval period call our rulers kings. Uh, if you look at the Latin sources, they are reges, right, Latin for rex in the plural. Um, if we look at the Scandinavian sources, they are Koningur, uh, which is the, the Old Norse for king. Uh, and so you'll see sources that say, you know, the Koningur of Rus met with the Koningur of Norway, which the Koningur of Sweden, etc. cetera. Um, so they don't make any distinction. Um, it's us in the modern period who begin to make that distinction. And, you know, since I mentioned Livonia earlier, there's a Chronicle of Henry of Livonia in the early 13th century. And there's a great translation of it. And the translator um, translates it reliably. So Henry says king. He says rex. And so the translator puts in the text rex equals king, right? King this of Novgorod. But then he adds a footnote. You know, Henry says he's a king, but he's really a prince. And that downgrades in our imagination what this ruler was. Henry's clearly telling us that he's a king. And in fact, uh, if we don't accept that, right, we're imposing our modern standards upon the past. And we do this um, largely because, once again, of historiography. So, you know, when um, the British traders first made it to Muscovy uh, in the 16th century, they found a Tsar at the top of the pyramid and below him were Kunyazya. And those Kinyazya and Tsar, they mapped their own political system. Uh, and so they found there that there was a, uh, they were dukes, typically, right? Uh, they were called dukes. And it's only later that princes became much a uh, more common translation. And so when we see the first English to uh, Russian dictionaries, right, Kinyaz is duke. And so it's actually just good citations <laughs> that's caused this problem mm-hmm. for so long is that people were like, oh, what does this word mean? Let's look in the dictionary, right? It goes back to you know, like the OED, right? It goes back to the use in the 16th century. Uh, but it doesn't mean the same thing in 1550 that it does in 1050. Um, and that's the big problem. And, and when I first began to talk about this and, and I wrote that book, Kingdom of Rus, the, I would get pushback of saying, Okay, but, you know, if, if they're kings, right, then what does that mean for, for my people in Western Europe? Then we've got to throw out all the titulature and start again. And I'd say, yes, you're right, but, you know, I only have so much time. Uh, but, you know, just this year, uh, I had a book come out, Rulers and Rulership in the Arc of Medieval Europe, where I talk about this very issue. And so there's a whole chapter on titulature that covers a broader swath of territory and really investigates what we call kings queens and emperors and why we use those words. Um, And so I have tried to uh, investigate that topic more broadly as a way, too, of integrating that discussion into the wider world. And, you know, one of my favorite quotes uh, from from doing all that research is um, from a Danish chronicler writing in Latin. He's actually writing uh, having to do with with uh, French affairs. Um, 
But he mentions Rus, and he says, non plure uh, ibi rege sunt, for they have many kings there. Like, yeah, they got a lot of kings there. There's no judgment, there's no derogatory sense, they just have a lot of kings. Uh, and one of the problems that we have in our modern conception is that we have really, really bought into the you know, early modern hierarchical structures. One must have a pyramid of authority, an organization chart, what have you, um, and decentralized rulership is a no-no. And so um, that's not something you can have, thus they didn't have it. And so we need to do something else. And the Scandinavianists, um, uh, you know, are always so receptive when I talk about this because in the Scandinavian sources, everybody's a Koninger. Um, and then in the English translations, you know, you'll often see that some people get the title chief and some people get the title king. And often uh, it depends on who their descendants are. Um, whereas if you look at the primary sources, they all have the same title. So, you know, there are these other areas and, and Ireland's another one uh, where we can have similar issues of titulature that don't map onto what we see for England and France. But you know, even in England and France, it's, it's so much more complicated than we like to see. I mean, Henry II, the famous Plantagenet king, you know, he crowns his son, also Henry, as a, a king as well, right? And so we've got those situations. Or, you know, hundreds of years earlier, Alfred the Great has a reggae under him. So it, it is a more complex situation. I think we've tried to elide that complexity because of our desire for organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, why is it important for us to figure this out and call people by what they think they were called? Yeah. Uh, what difference does it make whether we call them princes or kings? Yeah, so um, I think it makes a big difference. And I think part of the big difference is that we create a world uh, that, uh, that create a history, pardon me, that um, accurately depicts the world as it was in medieval times and doesn't recreate modern barriers and boundaries on the past. Um, and that's, I think, really important because when we do things like, um, you know, I was reading something the other day and it was talking about how, um, you know, if, if Churchill and Stalin and FDR had sat down to divide up Europe, um, they probably did have a map of the, you know, medieval Eastern Europe divide. Like, okay, they didn't really have that map, but, you know, we see these lines that are going to create these things. And when Dmitry Obolensky talks about the Byzantine Commonwealth, the world he's talking about is the land behind the Iron Curtain. Um, and if you look at, you know, a modern medieval Europe textbook in the Anglophone world, the area in that textbook that's dealt with is Western Europe, and the area that's not dealt with is Eastern. You know, I often show a map where um, the entire Eastern half of Europe is just blank from uh, some of these textbook maps. Why, right? You know, why do that? Um, you know, especially given the politics of today, if we were to depict um, Africa as, you know, like, uh, I remember totally inappropriate Bugs Bunny cartoon from when I was a kid of darkest Africa, right? And this unknown territory where there's nothing there, right? That would be not okay at all. And we wouldn't have to talk about why that wasn't okay. Um, but I think we need to try our best as historians to reflect the past as it was. And so what I like to really focus on is going back to what do the sources tell us rather than what interpretation can we put on the sources. Right? We can use all of our modern theories and interpretations. That's great, right? Um, but we also need to go back and find out what those sources tell us. Yeah, yeah. And so you, you raised the uh, Byzantine Commonwealth here, which uh, I, I've mentioned a little bit, but not in detail. Do you have to talk a bit more about what is the idea of the Byzantine Commonwealth and why you suggest the Byzantine ideal instead? Yeah, so the Byzantine Commonwealth was codified by Dmitry Obolensky in the 1970s um, and really has still been defended by the Oxbridge set, um, you know, all this time uh, for the last 50 years. Um, and what it is, is it creates a, a rival, basically, to medieval Europe in which uh, the medieval Latin world is one world and the Byzantine 
Commonwealth is a second. And you see this even in recent publications. You know, there was a Three Spheres book a couple of years ago where there was medieval Western Europe, the Byzantine world, and the Islamic world as the three spheres that made up the medieval Western Eurasian world. Um, and, and one of the issues here is that um, it takes that point of J.B. Burry's separating off the Byzantine and, and Eastern European world into one volume that I mentioned earlier of the Cambridge Medieval History, and it runs with it and says, you know what, fine, right? we are our own world, and we're going to do our own thing. And so, yes, you know, this Byzantine world, it was all under the Byzantine emperor. Um, Obolensky even includes language like, you know, the Slavs didn't know it because they weren't really that bright, but, you know, they did, they were under the Byzantine emperor. And, and you know, that's clear because if you look at Vladimir's marriage in 988-89 and then Ivan III's marriage in the 15th century, clearly they're connected to Byzantium. And it ignores several hundred years of history. But that wasn't the point, right? The point was to create a Byzantine world that was for all of these people. And, uh, you know, actually what happened was people ran with it. Um, and so one of the organizations I've been a big part of over my career is the Byzantine Studies Association of North America. And the Byzantine Studies Congress um, was founded by Walter Kagey and Alice Mary Talbot um, in large part as a way to give Byzantinists a conference of their own. Uh, so that they could have conference panels that they weren't getting accepted at the Medieval Academy of America or the International Medieval Congress at Kalamazoo. Um, but like the Byzantine Commonwealth, it creates a separate world and a separate path. And medievalists then can say, all right, I don't need to include you because you've got your own thing. Um, and in fact, even excellent medieval Europe textbooks uh, like Barbara Rosenwine's replicate that uh, Byzantine Commonwealth rhetoric um, and say, you know, a choice was made in 988 to separate uh, Rus off. Um, and, and that's really not the way that the, the history was, and, and it's reading a lot of things back. And so what I've tried to offer instead is that Byzantium um, is, of course, not really Byzantium. It's really the Roman Empire, and the work of Anthony Caldellis has really helped to solidify that recently. Um, and that this world was the Roman Empire and thus worthy of emulation. And so you see appropriation of all kinds of Romanness around medieval Europe, whether it is, um, you know, mosaics in the Italian peninsula, it's titulature under Otto III, uh, or it's things in Rus. It's not confined to Eastern Europe. It's not confined to an Orthodox world. All kinds of people, even the Turks, were interested in appropriating Romanness for themselves. Um, so I think that's a different way and a more accurate way of looking at the medieval past. It also helps us avoid some of these barriers, because that's one of the biggest problems I have, is that we have erected barriers that did not exist in the past. And that's caused problems in the way that we understand why events happen where people moved, how they lived, all of those sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah, and obviously Byzantium is something that was left off our history courses as well for a, a long time. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's uh, hard for me to say whether it's coming back in or not, because obviously I'm interested in Byzantium, but yeah, it seems to be that people are paying more attention again now. But yeah. Well, and, you know, one of the other outgrowths of all of this, too, is that jobs are structured around some of these areas and funding is structured around these areas. And so if you're a medievalist, are you a Byzantinist? Well, there's a Byzantine job, there's a medieval job, right? But now Byzantine jobs are going by the wayside and medieval jobs are having their own struggles. Um, and so that's going to create problems. You know, art historians have done an amazing job of, of being able to move between these worlds. And so art historians who focus on Byzantine topics sell themselves really well as medievalists. And Byzantine historians don't do that as well. And, and the same is true for all of the Slavic world of, of Slavic historians not selling themselves as medievalists. Okay, so... Maybe we could move forward a bit in time. So one of the problems, so to speak, in Rus development was their succession struggles. And after Vladimir and Yaroslav had 
brought for us together into a more or less unified country. It split up into three and then different cities going their own way. Um, was Rus always going to disintegrate or you know, just the Mongols put the, you know, the last blow in? Um, was, was there another scenario where they could have formed a, a longer lasting country there? Well, so I, I think one of the problems um, is built into the question is that centralization is the end goal. Um, and so, for instance, there's a, a recent book called Russia's Empires, which is a great book for imperial history, uh, but uses Rus as its base. And it talks about how, you know, Rus is not an empire and it's terrible and it's a planetary sphere of galaxies because it's never connected and never unites. And the goal of history is to create a unified whole. Uh, and that's not, I don't think, accurate. And that's something I deal with in my Rulers and Rulership book as well, is that, in fact, um, what we see in Rus, what we see in Poland, what we see in some of these places is that we have a corporate style of rule in which the family as a whole exercises some level of responsibility. And so I actually think the ruler in Kiev has sole responsibility for exterior defenses, for a variety of things like that, uh, for a long time. Uh, well after you know the death of Yaroslav in the middle of the 11th century. And we can see that by his ability to call on various rulers and get them to come to the defense against the steppe, or that he can appoint rulers to various locations. So I do think we see a lot more coherence there than is traditionally talked about. I also think the internecine rivalry is really oversold as well. I wrote a book a few years ago five or six years ago, about a uh, conflict uh, in Rus, and in, uh, actually in medieval Eastern Europe in general. Um, and, I, you know, we don't have more conflict in Rus than we have in a whole lot of other places. Um, you know, I talked about Henry II earlier in England. Uh, you know, Henry II's kids rebel against him with their mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine. They fight each other. They ally with Philip II of France. Um, but, but no one talks about the internecine rivalries of, of the Capetians or of the Plantagenets. Um, so I think this actually is another way that we can dismiss the history of Rus and of Poland, in particular, who has a similar thing after 1138, um, because they don't follow the same centralizing model that leads to a modern state as directly. Uh, the Germans have, have done wonderfully to avoid this uh, whole thing. And... You know, Thomas Huffman wrote a great book um, talking about German-English relations uh, about 30 years ago, um, where he says, you know, the Germans have gotten the shaft because of all of these things, but really they also had a polity just like the English. And, and that's what so many of us who don't do Western Europe, the extreme parts of Western Europe, really want is we just want to be just like the English too. Um, and, and I suspect that actually that's not normative. And so this new rulers and rulership book I mentioned um, is set in the arc of medieval Europe. And this is a territory that stretches from Iberia to Ireland, across Scandinavia, and down through Eastern Europe to Byzantium. And, and what I've tried to do is I've tried to look at what's going on with rulers and rulership in those areas. That's territorially, population-wise, the biggest part of medieval Europe. And what we see is that the English example is abnormal. Um, we in the Anglophone world especially have privileged it and made it normative. But actually, it isn't normal. Uh, and so that's really interesting um, when we look mm -hmm. at the majority of Europe to see that it's different than what we think the norm is. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Um, we get close on a, a more controversial question, maybe. Um, so you've already mentioned you know, the Russian Empire, which you know, they traditionally see as stretching back in a an unbroken line of development to early Rus, while right. you know, some Ukrainians might say that Rus is theirs and Russia has stolen their history. Um, obviously, we have yeah, the ideas of history that Russia is putting out these days to promote their claims in Ukraine and other places. So, uh, does does Rus belong to any one of its successor states, or is it its own thing? There, that 
Uh, I absolutely think it's its own thing, and I think we need to study it as if it's its own thing. Um, it should not be sole property of Ukraine. It should not be the sole property of Russia. Um, and I know everybody forgets about Belarus, but it should not be the sole property of Belarus mm-hmm. either. Um, and it is actually a medieval polity. Um, and one of the things that, that the 18th and 19th centuries really did for us is that we really tried so hard to connect the medieval past to the present as a way to justify and give us legitimacy. So the French are descended from Clovis and his Franks, and the Serbs are in the De Administrando Imperii, so they've been there ever since the, the ninth century. Um, but medieval polities are not modern polities. Um, they really don't map in the same way. They don't function in the same way. Um, so I think if we can just leave that question aside, it, it would be wonderful. Um, I know that's not how politics works. I know that's not how history mm-hmm. writing works, but I think that is important. You know, we could dig into the historiography and, you know, uh, uh, Mikhailo Khrushchevsky, um, whose history of Ukraine Rus is still a fantastic history of the region, even though it is certainly dated given that it was 100 years ago. Um, he writes about Rus as if it's part of medieval Europe. And, and I love that, the first three volumes that, that deal with the medieval period. Um, and he and you know uh, a variety of others had uh, ongoing debates about where the history of Rus fit into modern narratives. And you know for some of them, certainly it was contested, right? It's ours, no, it's yours. Um, and then others like Paul Milyukov, who was uh, you know a historian who even taught at the University of Chicago, but then became, of course, a figure of the cadets and the provisional government, um, was willing to say, you know what, fine, <laughs> Rus is part of Ukrainian history and, and we'll just live with it. Um, and so there are a variety of differing views if we go back 100 years. Now everything is so loaded with the politics and the war, um, and Putin's really interested in the history, uh, and he really wants to claim that, and he utilizes the PVL language about Kiev is the mother of Russian cities um, as a thing that he uh, has said numerous times. Um, uh, you know, the, the new forthcoming Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute translation of the, the PVL um, translates it, I would think, more accurately, which is the mother of the cities of Rus, right? which is a, a different way of expressing that same genitive form, right? but it's certainly, I think, more accurate. Um, and we see, too, you know, of course, the same year he invades Crimea, he erects the stage, statue of St. Vladimir in Moscow. Um, and even before this this current invasion, which started last year, there was a Ukrainian uh, political cartoon about uh, the statue of St. Vladimir in Moscow waking up and he looks down at the people and the, the, the Moscow River and is like, where am I? And the people walking yeah. by on the the, the Nabrezhnaya look up and they're like, who is that? <laughs> um, and, you know, it's very much claiming and trying to take the past. Uh, so, I mean, there's a lot of uh, a lot of really loaded things involved there. OK, well, thank you for coming on the show, Christian. And uh, maybe to finish, you could recommend a book to listeners that would be interesting for them to read. Absolutely. I'd be happy to. Uh, OK, I'm going to recommend a thick book, but it's a great book. It's Russia in the Early Modern World. Um, it is by Donald Ostrovsky, and it situates Russia in, just like the title says, the early modern world. And one of the big problems I, of course, am always arguing about is that Rus is part of medieval Europe. Ostrovsky is doing the same thing in the early modern world, and he's saying, you know what? Its ties reach to China. Its ties reach to England. Um, and, and we don't really think about those things. And, you know, for instance, uh, you know, the Muscovy Company in England, uh, you know, the, the, the head of the Muscovy Company is the head of the East India Company uh, in the early part of the 17th century, a guy named Smythe. And he's there for Boris Gudnov's coronation. Uh, he arranges a 10,000 uh, pound loan uh, to Mikhail. Um, so, I mean, there are all of these ties mm-hmm. that we don't usually talk about because we build silos around our history. Uh, and so Ostrovsky's Russia in the Early Modern World is a great book for breaking down those silos. Yeah, sounds very interesting. I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well for anybody who's uh, interested in reading that. And thank you for coming on the show, Christian. It's been uh, very interesting talking to you. Thank you so much, JP. This has been great. I really appreciate it.